did I not tell you during the Lille show how positive I felt going into this game at Arsenal? It's just that I don't expect it's going to happen this weekend. Of course I didn't expect us to win that game. Nobody did. And I especially did not expect Aston Villa to turn in arguably the performance of the season, which I'll attempt to justify a little bit later on. And apart from the players, I'm most happy for those supporters. The 3,000 or so who probably booked through Steve Goff and took the coach down to London, they must love going to the capital because that's 12 straight games now without a loss in London. The last was that fateful night at Craven Cottage that changed everything. Let's get into it. Arsenal nil, Aston Villa 2! Since Unai Emery arrived in B6, we have put together several statement performances. The first one that comes to mind is obviously Manchester City because we were so good that day. But let's remember, City was without Rodri, De Bruyne, Grealish, and Jeremy Doku. That certainly did not help the visitors on that day. A year ago, exactly, I was there as Villa dismantled Newcastle 3-0 absolutely flattered the Magpies. It was a wonderful performance. That's in there. And then earlier this year, we absolutely destroyed Brighton despite all this hype around Roberto De Zerbi. Really, the fortunes of the two clubs kind of changed after that game. But on Sunday, we were facing a fully fit Arsenal side that was on the brink, the cusp of first in the division, playing at home. And we delivered a performance for the ages. When this season concludes and the title winner is confirmed and we can forensically investigate the late stages of this campaign, there is no question that Aston Villa taking six out of six points from Arsenal this season will be significant. Not to mention what a statement performance like that could do for our morale in our quest for Champions League football. So, without question, in the table of virtuoso 90-minute Premier League performances under Unai Emery, yes, Manchester City was a crackling affair. The win over Newcastle a year ago was comprehensive, and beating down Brighton and Hove Albion earlier this year, also impressive. But this one, this win at the Emirates, now moves to the very top of that table, just given all the circumstances that I previously outlined. Welcome officially to the Holy Trinity Show, which is so much more fun to do when Villa turns in a performance like that as I review the three key issues or moments that defined Arsenal nil, Villa 2. And once again, I was very fortunate that Samir was at the Emirates capturing the incredible scenes on a day when Villa pulled the Premier League double over their hosts, for the third time in history, they did it in the lockout season 2021 and before that in 92-93. Sunday's win was also Villa's 19th of the season, which means we've won half of our games this campaign. I think that's a Premier League best for us, no? And we still have five games left to build on that. The key numbers evened out a lot from half one to two. Arsenal got into better XG positions. They had more shots, but Villa scored on both. And we were millimeters for making it three goals for three shots on target. Accurate passing, not far off. Possession close. But what changed the game for me was our ability to win ground duels. We started coming up with the ball more often as the game wore on, winning almost 55%. After the game, it was actually listed at 60%. I think they took a couple of duels away. This was away from home against that team. I think that made the difference.
The other thing that those numbers will tell you is that Aston Villa simply was more ruthless in this game. We had only one accurate cross in that entire 98 minutes. Do you know which one that was? The one that found Leon Bailey wide open at the back stick to make it bagel one. We had less than half as many touches in the opposition box as the home side, but we made the most of those touches because both Gabriel Jesus and Kai Havertz had very good situations in the penalty area in that first half, and they did not make the most of them. And when a game is reviewed, it's what happens in the individual penalty areas that usually determines the outcome. Obviously, a big factor in this or any game will be the starting 11, and graphically, it'll look a little funky uh, for you with this uh, background here. But I was happy to see a couple of tweaks that were born out of necessity because of Douglas Louise's suspension. I said on Thursday during the Lille show that, yes, John McGinn can play as a 10, and yes, he contributed to both goals in that game. So we get goals from him, and that's great. But what we lose is stability in the middle of the park. And with McGinn playing deeper, we got that solidity, that structure. He could string passes together, make tackles, fend off attackers. He has to play alongside Douglas Louise in that role in the second leg on Thursday. And you know, we, we have more than enough options as a number 10, which in this game was filled by Morgan Rogers. I said as well, I think this is his best position. And with he behind Ollie Watkins and Zaniolo wide left, it looked very logical and comfortable. And not to mention, we just had physical presence. I don't think either of those players are enjoyable to play against. Big, incredible moment. This one and a half minute sequence where the game could have turned on its head at either end. First, Ollie Watkins breaks in, gets a fortuitous bounce off the back of Zinchenko and does everything right except for maybe one thing. Maybe Ollie Watkins put too much power on this effort. If he had taken 10% less power or had 10% less carbs for breakfast, this probably nestles in. I have not seen a ball spin off the base of a post and then go wide of the far post like that. I don't think I've ever seen that. Then the ball goes down the park and somehow Leandro Trossard is denied by Emmy Martinez. I mean, you think about this moment and what would have happened had that gone in. The aggravation for Villa knowing that seconds before they came within a whisker of taking the lead only to fall behind, the irritation and aggravation of that, not to mention Arsenal scoring first, well, it could have turned the entire game on its head. I bang on all the time about the winning percentage of the team that scores first, especially the home side. I mean, it's in the upper 70s percentile for a reason. And you look at this save by Emmy Martinez. I mean, it literally could have been the number one moment in this match simply from that standpoint, how the momentum could have changed. Others will argue, in fact, I've seen several Arsenal fans say this, that Leandro Trossard should have done so much better in this moment, and it was more of a poor miss than it was a good save. After the game, Ollie Watkins said something absolutely incredible that I had not considered yet this season, and perhaps none of us had, as he is on the brink of a 20-goal Premier League season. He said that having to train against Emmy Martinez has made him a better striker. I mean, you think about it, the world's number one probably hates losing anything, including ping pong, hates conceding goals even in training, and has that conditioned Watkins to be sharper in front of goal. Ian Wright said the exact same thing about David Seaman, who he claimed was impossible to score on in training. Big issue, Diego Carlos was immense in this game. Our chiseled Brazilian showed signs of his quality in the first half of that Brentford game. In fact, he made almost an identical tackle in this game around about the half hour mark as he made in that one. The problem with Diego though, was what happened in the second half against Brentford and also on the 2-1 goal against Lille. It's about putting a 90-minute performance together. But here, he was quick, 
He was confident. He was poised under pressure. He completed 52 of 59 passes. That's a 92% passing completion. I mean, it was a 90-minute performance, and I think he justifiably did edge out Yuri Tielemans for man of the match, but when it's that hard to decide between two, three, four, or even five players, your team is probably winning on the day. Big moment, the introduction of Leon Bailey. Our squad is thin. We ended this game with Luca Dean and Alex Moreno both playing on our left side. I mean, that's what makes this all the more remarkable. But in Leon Bailey, Unai Emery had the proverbial ace up his sleeve as he was able to introduce a pair of jinky Jamaican legs as it seemed like Arsenal was beginning to tail off in the game, which then, of course, led to one of the game's big moments in the 84th minute where Leon Bailey clocked the ball coming across and made it look relatively easy, even though he was on his less preferred right foot, to slot home and change everything. And the reason why Leon Bailey was wide open to be able to latch on to the ball across was because another substitute, Gabriel Martinelli, didn't quite track his runner. I mean, the reason why Mikel Arteta's side is even in a position to win the title is because he has convinced an entire squad of players to work their behinds off out of possession. And this is one of those areas where, uh-oh, Martinelli doesn't track the runner and he knew it right away. But on this goal, by the way, Luca Dean plays an impeccable, quintessential, chaos-causing ball across. And had Pau Torres not gone to the near post, what was he even doing there? But in doing so, in attacking the near post, Pau Torres freezes David Rea, and that leads to the ball coming all the way across. Big issue. Yuri Tielemans turned in arguably his best ever performance in Clarendon Blue. Yes, he was excellent in the Manchester City home win as well, but he has been asked to play so many roles in this team. Where he was playing, he's played a little higher beneath the striker, he's played wide of the four, and in this case he was lined up next to John McGinn. And we don't think of Yuri Tielemans as this physical presence in the middle of the park. He's an elegant player with craft and vision. But on Sunday, he performed both parts of his job extremely well. And he too, like Ollie Watkins, came within inches of giving us a lead earlier and again, might have been the same problem. He hit it too hard. When's the last time you've seen it go crossbar and post and out? I mean, this was like the police battering ram analogy again. Watkins the first one, post and wide. Tielemans the second one. And on the third one, boom! It goes in. What Yuri Tielemans taught us in this game was that you do not have to be built like Rodri to be an effective central midfielder. I mean, Tielemans had an 88% passing percentage. He won six of his 10 ground duels and he had eight recoveries, one of which I'll show you in a moment. And one of the things that you get when you have Yuri Tielemans in your lineup is this. The ability to drop a ball on a dime over the top. This was one of three accurate long balls he plays in the game. Yes, Ollie Watkins makes the play by timing his run, which started in our own half. But Tielemans finds him to perfection. And isn't it ironic that two years ago, Emil Smith-Rowe scored a 2-0 goal at the Emirates against Villa. McGinn and Mings, I remember, were out to sea, and that was in the final stretch of Dean Smith's tenure. So there he scores the 2-0 goal in that game. Here, somehow, he finds himself as the last man defending Ollie Watkins. And really, because of the way he defended Watkins, he made Ollie's mind up for him to dink it. And that was the proverbial knockout punch against an opponent that was already staggering around the ring. All right, here we go. Big issue number three, bypassing the press. Aston Villa's ball retention and circulation in their own defensive third was absolutely immaculate on Sunday. And I know it's uncomfortable at times to watch Villa invite the press under the shadow of their own crossbar to then try to play around or through it. But time and time again, Arsenal, a team who's in the title challenge right now with the other two, partially because of how effectively they press could not catch up to the ball. 
and once we bypassed either around or through that first wave, there was space to attack. I don't think Emmy Martinez gets enough credit for the footballer that he's become since Unai Emery arrived. I mean, think about it. It's a major change to suddenly be expected to receive passes under pressure and then be expected to have a good passing completion ratio yourself. Diego Carlos was obviously brought in because of his short and long-range passing, and Pau Torres' talent is his ability to quickly position himself to receive the ball but give himself the time to then play it on further. I thought Esri Konza was tidy in possession and in positioning, and Luca Dean is an extremely gifted technical footballer. But it is demoralizing for the pressing team that over and over again, you put on the pressure, you expend the energy to chase, and yet time and time again, you are played around or through. Big issue number two, edgy Emirates. We're now going to delve into the mental side of football, which, in my opinion, was the biggest difference between these two teams on Sunday. You have an Arsenal team that had yet to lose in 2024 at home. In fact, they hadn't even fallen behind at home yet in 2024. They were ripping off big score lines of 4, 5, and 6, and their last Premier League loss was... The first game in January, 2-0 at Liverpool. And before kickoff, they would have seen that Liverpool lost 1-0 at home to Crystal Palace. So they knew that with the win, they could have topped the table at the end of the weekend. Opportunity knocked. Now, does Arsenal have the most talented squad among the three contenders? I don't think so. Are they the healthiest of the three contenders? They might just be. But I would argue that they might be the most settled of all three of those contenders and have really honed their way. You could argue that faltering at the end of last year might have been an experience that benefited Arsenal this year. We'll learn from that challenge this year. But the squad is so similar. Should Arsenal have brought in players that had experience of getting over that line. Declan Rice, fine player, helped West Ham win a Europa Conference League, but has never won a Premier League championship in his career. And then you've got the media in London that has Arsenal as their darling. The scrutiny must be enormous. I mean, imagine hearing a thousand times, are they going to stumble at the end? It's a justifiable narrative. And when the players keep hearing it, when the staff keeps hearing it, when the supporters keep hearing it, might that plant seeds of doubt in the actual run-in? It's one thing for the players and the technical staff to overcome that mental hurdle. It's quite another for the localized media, which of course inflames the supporters and then the supporters themselves. I mean, 21 years since their last title, that's a heavy burden for the manager and the players to overcome, especially when they're so close to it once again. But I could feel even through my television from 7,400 miles away an angst inside the Emirates. You think about Liverpool and their supporters. They've experienced winning, as have Manchester City. You could argue that they now expect to win. 21 years, that is a generation of supporters who have not tasted victory and they have had nothing but high expectations with no fulfillment in the end. That is going to be the hardest thing for Arsenal to overcome in these final weeks, and Aston Villa has only planted another seed of doubt with what happened on Sunday. Just before I get to number one, I was utterly mortified to find out that there were many very unhappy people at the Aston Social following the Brentford game when I didn't show up. And this was a massive communication failure between Paul Hansaker and myself, and unfortunately, Paul had to take the brunt of it. Obviously, had I known what the expectation was, I would have changed my schedule and my itinerary and I would have made it work. And both Paul and myself are cut from the same cloth. We hate over-promising and then not delivering, so we're going to make this right. If you were at the Aston Social after the Brentford game, I need you to send me an email. Tell me who you were with, holytrinityshow at gmail.com. I need to find out who was there so I could reach out when we have plans in place. But truly, Paul and I... We ankle-mend this one, and for that I sincerely apologize, and we're going to try to put it right. 
And the number one big issue that defined Arsenal nil, Villa 2, Unai put the AV in Brave. We're going to flip the mental coin now. Here we have an Aston Villa team that concedes we are not going to win the title this year, and we've gone longer than most teams since winning a major trophy. And we've been conditioned as both supporters and players in the past to think, well, we'll hope for the best, but we'll expect the worst. Then along comes a world-class, credible manager who changes everything. And most importantly of all, he changes the individual and collective mentality. And he's asked the supporters to be part of that process. And because of that, we have become major disruptors in this campaign. And that is entirely down to this. Unai Emery would have told his players before this game and reiterated it again at halftime in what must have been a very impressive speech given how things played out after halftime, that the biggest temptation in this game will be to abandon our structure, abandon our way, a possession, pressing, defying control game, and instead resort to the long panic balls in behind the Arsenal fullbacks. And think about it, we're going to the Emirates, a fortress for Arsenal this year. With a win, they could go top of the league. Of course, the media does this with Aston Villa. We're irrelevant in the Sky 6 media's eyes. And what do we do? We stick to our principles and our structure. And that takes bravery under the circumstances. And there is nothing that exemplifies bravery more than playing straight up penetrating split balls through the lines of confrontation, which we did time and time again, and also asking for and receiving passes under pressure, which we also did time and time again with great success. We were so good playing around and through their pressure by just sticking with it. And somewhere around the 35th minute, our players started to sense, they talked about this at halftime, that Arsenal was tailing off. And a big moment in the 75th minute when Martin Odegaard had to be withdrawn, arguably the player that stirs that drink, you know, and all of a sudden our poise increased under pressure. Our confidence on the ball was noticeable. Suddenly we started winning those second balls and retaining possession even better. And you know, Arsenal is a fully fit now and settled side. We are razor thin. We're being held together by band-aids. Do you know how easy it would have been for the players to say, ah, you know, we're just a thin squad being patched together here. We can't do this away from home at the Emirates against a team like this. And they didn't. They stuck with it because of their mental bravery. And maybe the most important thing about the statement nature of this performance is that we can now use it as a reference point in what could be some very big games in the run-in. Many people have already said it was an Unai Emery masterclass. I would make the argument that the style and principles of play are exactly the same as they have been since he first arrived at Aston Villa. The difference on this day was the stakes were extremely high and the lineup was somewhat patchwork because our squad is so thin. I mean, it's basically the surviving soldiers, the next man up that's going in and the players delivered impeccably well. I mean, you can have video sessions and expose the opponent's weaknesses, then employ those strategies in practice on the training ground. But all of that goes out the window the minute that opening whistle sounds and there are 57,000 people and a referee against you. On this day, it was the players who provided the masterclass. When we review the implications of this victory on the categories I like to follow, well, first of all, a massive away win, another Ollie Watkins goal as he closes in on a 20 goal Premier League season. Not sure we can call the 0-1 goal a set piece goal because it looked like there were a couple of phases between the corner and the ball finally entering the net. We improve against the top six. That number is starting to look pretty good. We added two second half goals to the ledger. And what will this mean to Emmy Martinez as he earns his 50th clean sheet in Aston Villa colors at the home of his former employer and the home of Unai Emery's former employer? It is a surreal and incredible day. Now, last Thursday, I said that we looked second best at home to Lille, a side which is less than half the overall transfer value 
of our side. And that if we put in a performance like that in France this coming Thursday, well, we could be in trouble. But now this performance on Sunday kind of changes everything again. On one hand, surely that will give us some belief that we can go away and turn in a fantastic and confident and poised display, maybe even with a very similar lineup. The concern I have is that we might have also expended a lot of physical and emotional energy on Sunday at the Emirates. And it's not really this stretch, the Sunday to Thursday preparation time I'm worried about. It's the following Thursday to then Sunday, which concerns me because it also involves travel. Lille is a good, young, energetic, well-coached side, and they're going to have a record crowd behind them on Thursday. Will that boost them? Will that help them? Or could that cause a similar kind of pressure to what Arsenal experienced on Sunday? More importantly, will Villa come into that game with the same level of bravery and structure and confidence for that second leg? And maybe most importantly of all, will we have gas left in the tank for Bournemouth's arrival on Sunday? Because as great as the Arsenal win was, it's almost wasted if we don't take maximum points at home against the Cherries, who I thought were excellent against Manchester United and maybe should have won that game. And they were a handful when we went there earlier this season. It is going to be a huge week. And in addition to what we accomplished, Tottenham lost at Newcastle on Saturday and frankly, 4-0 flattered Spurs. United dropped two points at Bournemouth. I think it's safe to say that for Manchester United and Newcastle United, trying to catch fifth or us 13 points behind, ooh, that's going to be a real difficult challenge. But maybe the most important thing, I'll say it again from Sunday, is that everybody associated with the club, the players, the staff, and the supporters themselves, is we have that belief, that reference point for when idiots come along and say things like, it's just that I don't expect it's going to happen this weekend. Savor that one. Watch it again. It is so much more enjoyable to watch it a second time. Feel those feels again. And until Lille on Thursday, be well. And as always, up the mighty villa.